Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Porterfield, the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you here in the Greenwald Pavilion, our listening audience on Aspen Public Radio, and our audience watching online to the first McCloskey Speaker Series event of the summer. Please join me in thanking Bonnie and Tom McCloskey, who are here this evening. and their family for sponsoring this remarkable series, which brings leaders and thinkers from every field and every corner of the world to our campus in Aspen for remarkable public discourse. Thank you as well to the Aspen Institute's Crystal Logan and Julian Scott for all of their work to organize this series. I would also like to extend the thoughts and support of the Aspen Institute to the entire Roaring Fork Valley community which has been coping with the late Christine fire. The brave... <laughs> the bravery and tireless service of the firefighters and law enforcement officers is inspiring to us all. The Aspen Institute and Aspen Meadows have made arrangements for a number of our employees who have been displaced in the past few days. Fortunately, there have not been any reported fatalities or injuries. We at the Aspen Institute are also evaluating how we can be supportive in the days and weeks to come to the full community. And I'm very pleased to announce today that we have made a sizable contribution to the Aspen Community Foundation, which is coordinating and distributing relief resources. If any of you have suggestions for how we can be helpful, uh, please be in touch with us. And now, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. We're honored to have with us Joshua Johnson, the founding host of 1A, a national news and talk radio program produced by WAMU in Washington, D.C. and distributed by NPR, in conversation with an, an eminent American who needs no introduction, Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, Stephen Breyer. I have... Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you all for being here, especially those of you who may well have been impacted by this fire. We certainly wish you all the best as the firefight continues. I appreciate you making time for us. I hope that this conversation with Justice Breyer will be time well spent. We'll look forward to getting to some of your questions a little bit later on in this conversation. We have about 55 minutes to get done what we're going to do, both here online and on Aspen Public Radio, but I work in radio. We can do a lot with 55 minutes. <laughs> Justice Breyer, welcome. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to come back here. I love it here. I'm sorry about the fire. I'm very, it's... So everybody back in D.C. wants me to ask one thing. <laughs> yes, that's good. Right. I don't know if you know what that is, or... You know. But just to make him crazy, I'm not going to start with that. Yes, I know, see? We'll get to that. I promise we'll get to that. But I wanted to get to something first that we discussed a few minutes ago before we stepped out here. You came here today with something you had written down, a, a paragraph. I, I, I won't ask you to read the whole thing, but I wonder if I could prevail upon you to read just that first section of it as it relates to some of your legal philosophy. Could well, you? well, let's explain. Yeah, explain where it comes explain from, and then I love you. Explain that, that this is more difficult for me than usual because of what's going on in Washington. Right. So I had to work out how could I appear to say something while, in fact, saying the most boring thing <laughs> I could possibly invent. <laughs> and even then it might not work. <laughs> what, what I told, we'll know, because if the Republican newspapers say I'm favoring or not favoring Republicans, or the Democratic newspapers say the same thing in respect to their party and whatever part, et cetera, then we know I've done it wrong. But if in the end of 55 minutes, every single one of you is asleep, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically the idea. <laughs> right. Now, I wrote down, I said, what is law? There is, I told him about what uh, we were talking about, what is a great tradition in law, and there is a, that's a tradition I think that I uh, ascribe to. Uh, it's gone on for 100 years. And it's that law is complicated, is what it comes on down to. It's uh, uh, pragmatic, it's adaptive, uh, it proceeds slowly uh, over time, 
And, and if you're a judge, you have to look at cases, and you have to read the words, and you have to uh, try to figure out what institutions, I mean, you know, bankruptcy is in fact an institution, and so is ERISA. And ERISA, don't ask me to explain it, because you will be asleep right. at the end of the time. All right, I don't want but, that. Yeah, yeah, it, they serve human beings. And so you are aware of the long time frame. You are aware that what you are deciding in a case is not just for these people in front of you, nor just for the judges who probably have come to different conclusions about it now. It will last. It's for uh, the other judges who will have to follow what you say. It is for lawyers who will have to explain it to clients. It is for clients who will, in fact, have to live with it. And indeed, it's for a lot of people who have never seen a law office because they will be affected by it. Now, all that comes in. Does it all come in in every case? In a sense, yes. Does a judge think about it in every case? Not unless he's uh, Superman or something. I mean, you can't. But in some cases, certain aspects are more prominent than in others. And so it's complex. That's the idea. And there will be change. If there were no change, we're frozen to death in the 18th century or earlier. And if there is too much change, people can't adapt. They don't know how to leave their lives. And that's why we have principles that say, go slowly. And uh, there we are. Which, yeah, there's one phrase in particular in what you've written that has mm -hmm. to do with the law as being something, part of a tradition that is pragmatic, undogmatic, mm -hmm. and adaptive. Yes. I think I, you, yeah, yeah. I wonder how you view, in light of that, how you view this time in our nation's civic life. Because there seems to be very little in our public discourse that is pragmatic or undogmatic or adaptive. We feel like the gears are just grinding all of the time, whereas you're part of an institution that is designed to just function despite the difficulties of opinion, despite the differences of perspective. As someone who sits in that august institution, how do you view this moment in our civic life? Well, let's go, let's go back. When you say this moment, uh, let's go back. And I'll ask, at least rhetorically, uh, in the 1830s or 1840s, when there was a legal question about uh, the federal government. No, it was Georgia, actually. Let's say what it was. It was Georgia. They found gold. The land that they founded on belonged to the Cherokees. And so they took it. Because after all, they thought, why should the Indians have this gold? Why shouldn't we? We are Georgians, and they are not. And law cases were brought. And they, Indians, naturally won. They were totally right. And the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, uh, said uh, John Marshall, the Supreme Court Chief Justice, has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. And he sent troops, you say, but not to enforce the decision, but rather to drive out the Indians to Oklahoma, where they live in this day. So was that a period that was, uh, would you say, uh, what were the words? Uh, uh, pragmatic, pragmatic, and dogmatic, and adaptive. Undogmatic and adaptive? Well, maybe in a sense, but not in a very good sense. Or let's go through the pre-Civil War days. Or let's go through the Civil War days. Or let's go through Reconstruction. Or let's go through 80 years, just about, of legal segregation. And uh, do you think those were days that were, what, uh, pragmatic, adaptive? Well, they were adaptive. I didn't see it. Uh, the, 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 uh, 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 and so we've lived through lots of history in the United States. And some of it has turned out pretty well, and some of it has not. And the amazing thing about it, I think, is what Tocqueville said in about 1840, when he came over here, and he said the first thing he notices was the clamor. Huh? What's that? Noise. What did he mean by that? He said what he meant. He meant the clamor of every group under the sun trying to work out their differences, and maybe they should have been more polite about it, but they had institutions that helped them work things out. Uh, there were uh, 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 police associations. There were civil liberties associations. There was this one. There was that one. There were newspapers. Try reading the newspapers then. And uh, uh, there, there were uh, 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 legislatures of states and city councils and uh, everything under the sun, and what we tended to do was we took all kinds of different views, and then we tried to work something out. 
and some worked better and some didn't. And our job on the Supreme Court then, and I think it's just as now, when it's best, it comes in last. Why? Because I hate to tell you, we are not great experts on all these different subjects. But we can look at what other people have decided to do about such matters as privacy and the internet. We can look at that, and we can take this document, and we can say, this document, the Constitution, creates frontiers. They create boundaries. And we can try to say whether this particular solution that's in front of us has crossed the boundary. Okay? And sometimes we're right, and sometimes we're wrong. But at least we have an institution that's charged with that kind of job. And that's probably better than using armed weapons. <laughs> I would imagine it's a lot better than using armed weapons. Well, I say that to students at Stanford. And you want a tough one. I get this question. Uh, what about Bush v. Gore? Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. And I quote to them what Harry Reid said in the hall of, our, of my building, of our, the Supreme Court, where we were at dinner, he said the most remarkable thing about that case is something it's hardly ever remarked, despite the fact that it was important. Yeah. It was uh, unpopular. I say at least with half, maybe a few more than half, but, but uh, uh, <laughs> at least. And I thought it was wrong. I was in dissent, OK? Despite that. Right. Fine. <laughs> That's how I actually feel about most of my dissents. <laughs> but the, the, but the, 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 the fact is, despite that, people followed it. And I have my Stanford audience. I know what they're thinking. I say, I know right now when I say that, that at least 20% of you are thinking too bad there weren't a few guns or stones or something. And I say, I know that's what you're thinking. So turn on the television set. Uh -huh. And see what happens in countries that decide their big problems and differences that way. So I don't think it's so bad to have an institution that will, in fact, say, Mr. Legislator, Mr. Uh, Governor or President or whoever, does your solution comport with this basic document? Even if I disagree with the results, even if, and I do. And I do not disagree with every result. That's a false rumor. I disagree with some results, right. as does everyone. OK? So that gives you a picture. That gives you a picture. When Complicated, pragmatic, institutional, changes slowly over time. Not always, but mostly. And uh, we're in there for the long run. And we are the border patrol. Now, you keep all those things in mind. And uh, uh, Think about them while you're asleep, all right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no, they're quite awake. Right. When you do write a dissent, how do you view your role as a dissenter on the court? What's the value to you for posterity of being someone who says, yeah, that's what the majority thinks, but I, that, I think they're wrong, and here's why? That is a very, very good question. And uh, there, there are different kinds of dissent. And the best kind of dissent is you're writing a dissent to try to convince someone who it's tentatively, because it's always tentative until the last minute, on the other side. And you're saying, you see, see it this way. See it this way. That's why. And nobody who writes an opinion likes to look like an idiot. So if you have a good argument there, they'll change it. And how much will they change it? And to what extent? And will the whole thing change? And that's always up for grabs. And so the best kind of dissent is where you feel you're doing that, you're going to point something out, and you have a hope here of at least a major change for the future, even if they don't join you. Now it gets more complicated. What about a constitutional provision? Well, there you have perhaps more reason to dissent because the Constitution changes somewhat more quickly than a statute because Congress can't do anything about the Constitution, you see. So we're the only ones who can do something about it. And, and therefore, we're a little bit more open to change. Maybe, but, but no, it's a little, yeah. And you, you write it. You say, why doesn't the world have the benefit of my wonderful writing? There is an element of that. And that is actually institutionally irrelevant. Or, but what about a statute? But then this is the hardest one for me. Uh, a statute. I'm in the dissent. 
I can write what I want. I've got all my changes made. I'm not going to get any better, from my point of view, this majority. Do I write something? Publish it? Well, hmm. There, there are sort of arguments one way and arguments the other way. Arguments the one way, even so, it's you've put a way here of deciding a case that people may eventually, even if they change this case, they don't want to change the case, but, but, but they will see how you do it, and, and that, that might help some people. Or maybe you want to say, be a voice, that some people will say, well, at least there were some in there who uh, really saw the point. They'll think, if they agree with you. Uh, on the other hand, or you could say, let this one pass. And if you look back to the period with Holmes, early part of the 20th century, that happened a lot. 19th century happened a lot. People said, let it pass. Congress can change it. I can't do anything, really. I won't write a dissent. So kind of the legal philosophy around dissent has you changed. Could. You could. I think it has. I think there are more of them. And now, what, 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 so, so what's wrong with writing the dissent? You've got all the arguments in your head. Put it down. Well, the more five fours, the more dissents. What are you doing? Trickle, 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 trickle to what is a great need, and that is a need for confidence in the institution. Does that mean that you, since you mentioned five fours, does the court try not to end up with five fours? Like, is there an effort to try to have yeah, more I think there seven, is. two, eight, one decisions? I think there is. I think there is. Now, you can say, how much? Shouldn't it be more? And if you're in the four, you certainly think it should be more. <laughs> and and uh, uh, you think, well, why is it so important to try to get more together? And uh, the obvious example, think of what Earl Warren did to try to get nine people on that opinion, Brown versus, edu uh, of edu Brown versus Board of Education, ending segregation. He thought that was pretty important. And think of what happened after that. 1954, the opinion came down. And do you know what happened in 1955? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. Yeah, That's right, know. nothing. And 1956? Yeah, every state nothing. fought yeah, like hell. Nothing, the nothing, yeah. nothing. Yeah. And uh, you remember, I remember impeach Earl Warren signs all over the South. And uh, yeah, and uh, I, I remember Little Rock. I, not everyone can remember that now, particularly when I'm talking to a college audience. I said, well, you better read about it. You better learn about it. You better learn how a judge said, yes, now is the time, and to integrate that central high school. And Governor Faubus got out in front of the school with the White Citizens Council and said, no. He said, the judge, the judge has an order, but I have the state police. And we remember, I remember, and they could, should see it, Elizabeth Eckford reading that book. Black girl trying to go into the white school, turned away, and she's reading like this with her books and uh, the girl behind her. Her face contorted with anger at the thought of a black child going into this school. And to end that, Eisenhower had to send a 1,000 paratroopers, which was not such an easy decision at that time, because he was told by Jimmy Burns, former Supreme Court justice, resigned to run our war effort on the civilian side, moderate on race, governor of South Carolina. He said, Mr. President, if you send troops to Little Rock, you better be prepared to occupy the entire South. You better be prepared for a second reconstruction. But Herbert Brownell said to the president, send them. It's a question of the rule of law. Do it. And he did it. A thousand, a thousand from Fort Bragg, the, the, uh, the 101st Airborne, and uh, the, everybody knew who they were then. They were the people who'd been uh, hung up on those church steeples at right. uh, Normandy and had fought the Battle of the Bulge, and they went there and took those children by the hand and walked into the white school. All right? right. But they couldn't stay. What? Since you brought up the relationship between the court and the public in Brown v. Board, mm. I wonder if we could come forward to the relationship today sort of by way of talking about Justice Kennedy and the, the nomination that'll be announced on Monday, I wonder how you see the public's relationship with the Supreme Court. It seems like many people who are the most passionate about whoever this nominee is going to be, and I, I 
I don't want you to, to stray into territory you can't discuss regarding the nominee or the, or the process, but it feels like a lot of people have a real dog in this fight. They want something from the Supreme Court, and they want someone who's going to give it to them. But that's not really the court's job. The court's job is to kind of wrestle with whatever legal questions come before it in a thoughtful and a fair manner, but try telling that to people who are fired up about Roe v. Wade, or Hobby Lobby, or Obamacare, or same-sex marriage, or you know, the travel ban. How do you see the public's relationship with the Supreme Court today? Do people really get what your job is? Well, yeah, I wish Sandra O'Connor were here. And I really do, I loved her, and, and I did, I did. And, and I think what she would say, and Tony too, Tony Kennedy, and me, and probably everybody, is that the most significant thing we can do is to encourage, we were talking about this at lunch, people to teach civics in the high schools, because they have to know what we do. And I say that if you say, I'll get to today, I can get at least to today, I'd say four years ago from today. <laughs> because in my office, I think four years ago or five years ago, asking the same question, you see, was the president or the chief justice of the Ghana Supreme Court? And she was trying to make a tremendous effort, which I hope she's, she's been somewhat successful, to bring civil rights and, and uh, 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 d democratic processes uh, into that Ghanaian government to see that they stick. And she said, why do people do what you say? Why do people do what you say? Yeah. You mean like why do people abide by Supreme Court rules? Yeah, that's right. Why? And that's why I brought up Little Rock. Because there's no good answer to that. There's no single sentence that answers that. We are nine people. Because after those paratroopers were there, the day came when they left. And on that day, Governor Faubus, they passed a new board resolution saying resegregate. And that went to the Supreme Court, Cooper versus Aaron. And in Cooper versus Aaron, all nine said integrate. And you know what happened? He closed the schools. That's what happened. I told her that. And I said, yeah, he closed the schools. But it didn't last. And I said, in my opinion, why didn't it last? Because by that time, we'd had the bus boycott, we had Martin Luther King, we had the Freedom Riders, we had all kinds of people who, and contrary to popular belief, I've said this five million times, of our 320 million people in America, 319 million are not judges or lawyers. <laughs> and those are the people, those are the ones that you have to convince that it is worth having judges whom you will follow when you disagree. And that was, in fact, uh, that was uh, Harry Reid's point. And that's the point I want to make to the Stanford students. It's so easy to say follow when you agree. And it's a little tougher when you don't. Could I ask you about something that, that's one of these, let me shift gears a little bit to one of these recent legal controversies that I think a lot of people have been following quite a bit as it relates to the relationship between the public and the Supreme, the Supreme Court. There have been a number of recent decisions that have been written in a fairly narrowly tailored way, dealing with some big issues, the gerrymandering decisions in Wisconsin and Maryland, for example. And in those cases, a lot of people really wanted the court to definitively answer the question of whether designing political districts to advantage one party over another is constitutional or not. And the court hasn't answered that. And I, I guess I understand that we were dying to know. We don't really care about Maryland or Wisconsin as much as we care about this larger legal question. I think I speak for a lot of Americans when I ask you in that regard, what were you waiting for? Why not just answer the question if, we, if you know that's what we need? I'm not talking about this particular case. But I will remind you, go back in general, there are a lot of cases. There are a lot of cases where people see the law and they understand how you might deal with it in this situation. If you go back to a case in your subject called Veith, you will see that four of us thought that there were standards to govern such things, which is the problem. And each of the four of us had a different standard. 
So Nino, who was writing The Descent, I really miss Nino, he was great. And he was, he was. We had a very, we used to debate these things and we'd go to high schools or colleges and we'd talk about our different points of view and I think they come away feeling we were friends and they came away feeling that the institution makes more sense than they had thought perhaps previously. And that was a good thing to do. I'm so glad we did it. But he did, he couldn't resist saying this. The dissenters all think we can have standards and they each have a different one. So I said, well, yeah, but maybe one of them will work. That got nowhere, of course. <laughs> so so my, my, my point is, is really this. You have individual cases. You have people who may think different things. And you try to work it out. And, some, and, and working it out is highly complex. And that's why we started with this little insight into how complex it can be. And there, there, there isn't a simple short answer to that. And that's why you read the opinions, you see what they say, you get an idea how different ones of us feel, and then we go on to the next case. There are a lot of cases. And uh, that's why I said to the woman in Ghana, and I wanted to say to her, look, the people you have to convince that this is a worthwhile institution, it's worth having these nine unelected people or more unelected people sometimes say things that you think are important, absolutely wrong, and uh, yet that's their view of it, and then you do it. Oh, dear. But until you get them convinced that it's worth having an institution like that, it's called the rule of law, you won't have it. And while you were talking, because he's interested in theater, and uh, just like a, 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 you know, uh, what were we talking about? Literature or something. Mm -hmm. It's true. I, it made me think of, of, of Ben Bold, the fa fa famous. He says, and he has, uh, um, who's the uh, Lord Chancellor, you know, who, uh, the Lord Chancellor in England, who was Henry VIII's Lord Chancellor. And, thank, you, thank you, thank you. See, that's what I need now. If you were in the conference room, I would have no problem. I'd just ask you. <laughs> and you, and you were my, it's true. But uh, yeah, it was Thomas More. And it, well, the line that resonates with every one of us in the law is where he says, yes, and when those trees are all cut down, then where will you be? I mean, that is the law. And that is the rule of law he's trying to follow. And that's the question. And, and until people think that it's more important, and you can't say ne always, you never say maybe there's a say, but until you think it's more important to have all those trees chopped down, you better stick to the rule of law. And if you want to know what good that's doing you, you better get Sandra O'Connor back on the bandwagon here <laughs> and get that taught in the high schools. Let me ask you about something you mentioned in, in your latest book. It's called The Court and the World, American Law and the New Global Realities. You reference the Roman statesman Cicero who wrote, and I'm translating, when the cannons roar, the laws fall silent, mm -hmm. referring to the powers of a president during national security crises and wars and other exigencies. These days we hear a lot about the Supreme Court dealing with domestic controversies like gerrymandering, like health care. You write about the court's role in dealing with, with international challenges. And I wonder how you see the frontier of that, particularly as we as a nation deal with how to deal with non-state actors, foreign tier organizations, where the rule of law deals with the power of the presidency and the executive in a whole new frontier in situations that we're not familiar with. How do you see the court dealing with that? Uh, uh, what I wanted to do in that book was I wanted to show to the, to the reader what the world is like as a justice in this institution, the Supreme Court, in a particular aspect, namely, that lots of our cases, in order to decide them correctly, under American law, require us to know something about what's going on beyond our shores. And it doesn't take much to think of that. You can think of diseases that might spread. You can think of environmental problems. You can think of business problems all over the place. You can think of civil rights and civil liberties, which is where you're going. And, and after all, the problem arises because the Constitution gives the power to make us secure to the president and to the Congress, not to the court that knows very little about that, not to the court. But the court does have power to protect civil liberties. So what do we do when these two things clash? And even there, 
I thought if we're going to be involved in this kind of project, we better know something about it. And we better know what other countries do. And many are, they are democracies too. And so even there, the need to know something about what's happening abroad creeps in and is important. The particular quote from, uh, from Cicero, which was something like, uh, uh, Arma decant legis silant, or something yeah, like that. I can find the Latin if you really want it. Yeah, that's all right. Don't. But okay. I translated it for a long time. I said it just like you said it. I said, when the cannons roar, the laws fall silent. Uh, but the problem was I was once talking to an audience about that, and they said, don't you know the Romans didn't have cannons? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, so, so there I was. I was stuck. But none, 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 nonetheless, the point was made. And, and so, so uh, uh, hey, uh, we, we, this court stayed out of it. And go back and look and see what happened. The Alien and Sedition Act, the courts weren't involved, or the Civil War. They had a big problem, Lincoln. And it's hardly surprising the court didn't get involved, really, until the war was over, which is easy then. And think of Korematsu. You know, the Japanese, 70,000 American citizens imprisoned. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, and it goes to the court in 44, in 42, I'm from San Francisco, I can remember the blackout shades. Maybe in 42, General Witt, who was in the Sixth Army out in the uh, Presidio, he might have thought that there'd be an invasion, but by 44, nobody thought that. And it was pretty clear they didn't have any evidence that would uh, allow these people to be imprisoned, but they upheld the government six to three. And Frankfurter says Black came into the conference and started by saying, well, somebody has to run this war. It's either Roosevelt or us, and we can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Well, go read the Guantanamo cases if you're interested. And if not, I'll tell you what they say that's important. <laughs> what they say that I think is the most important is what Sandra said. She said, and this is not Cicero. This is the opposite of Cicero. He said, the Constitution does not write the president a blank check not even in time of war. Okay. So now, bring you up to date, that means we're in the business. And people who say, stay out of that business, I say, what do you want, Korematsu? Mm -hmm. So we're in it. Well, we better learn something. We better know something. Don't go too far. Try to figure out, well, why didn't you answer all these questions about hearsay and so forth in, in the uh, Guantanamo cases where we did decide for the, for the uh, person who was being held cap in captivity uh, in Guantanamo, four cases, four decisions against the president, four decisions for the captive. Why didn't you decide all these things? Because we don't know the answers. Because it has to go slowly. You have to learn something. That's the reality. So try business. Try the environment. Try disease. Try, try, try. It's worldwide. And we don't participate, hey, the world will go along without us. And we'll then have to, uh, we'll have to uh, uh, live with the results. So I want to show what specifically that means in the legal cases that I've seen come to us, and they've tripled, quadrupled in number, cases where you have to know something about what goes on abroad. I'm not saying what policy in other places should be. I'm just telling people what our cases look like. And that's why I brought that up. I do want to get to some of your questions in about 10 minutes, but there are a few more things I want to ask you about. Since you brought up civil liberties, I wonder where you see the court's thought process moving on dealing with issues of civil rights and civil liberties. You mentioned the Korematsu case. That was referenced just recently in the travel ban case in, in the, the opinion saying that the Korematsu case was wrong then and it's wrong now. The centers also mentioned that the travel ban is wrong for the same reason that Korematsu was wrong. So that came up in a number of different contexts. Uh, Justice Kennedy, who is soon to retire, wrote the decision in the Obergefell v. Hodges case, which ruled that same-sex couples have a constitutional right to marry. He also wrote the decision in the case of Masterpiece Cake Shop, which said that a Colorado baker had been maligned in his First Amendment rights in terms of not creating a, an original cake for a same-sex couple. I, I wonder where you see this intersection of civil rights, civil liberties, First Amendment protections, minority rights as the court deals with it and, and thinks through it. Where's that going? We don't think generally. I mean, we don't, oh, I shouldn't say that. That's really bad. 
That's yeah, a, take that like, again. I better not say it that no, way. No, no, no. That's a, I, I mean, in general, that's like, you know, David Souter and I were always getting, people would call me Souter, and they'd call him uh, Breyer sometimes, all right. Because, <laughs> and I don't know why, maybe because we were both, uh, uh, came to the court from New England, whatever it is. So Sandra O'Connor's clerks uh, uh, took him out for lunch one day, and they wanted to raise this. They didn't know if this was true, so they said, uh, Justice Souter, is it, you, is it true that you and Justice Breyer are often confused? <laughs> they got worse because then they decided that was wrong. And, and so then they said, is, oh, I mean, we mean, is it true that you and Justice Breyer are often mixed up? <laughs> so there we are. That right. was my last answer. Okay. Exactly. Now, exactly. And, uh, they should just quit digging. I, yeah, yeah, right. right. It, it, the, 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 the point is that, that, that you do decide things case by case. You don't plan out a general direction. That's really not the job. Now, of course, if I've written, I've written, uh, for example, uh, uh, a long dissent uh, on the question of whether uh, certain immigrants should be given bail. Now, the court didn't decide that. So if that comes back, I, I'll probably start anyway with what I've already written. And so the, naturally, in that respect, a particular case about a particular thing, uh, you, you have a direction. But in general, the job is, and this is where I started, you take the case, and there are 60 of them or 70, and the vast majority are, you know, they're, they're like about Arissa. I had one where Clarence Thomas, who was, I liked very much, we always sat next to each other for years, and, and it was so complicated. He said in the, uh, as we were going in, he said, this is a, really a question of uh, uh, what you should do if ERISA were interpreted in light of EDPA, which was to be interpreted in the light of IIRA. See, those are three things nobody knows what they are. Yeah, so, you, you, so, you so I said it. that from the bench, and everybody, I shouldn't have. But nonetheless, <laughs> not, not, nonetheless, a lot of them are these words in a statute. And the reason we have them is because lower court judges have come to different conclusions about the same question of federal law. And ever since Taft was the Chief Justice, he said that's the primary job of the Supreme Court. Iron out the law where the lower court judges have, have uh, uh, come to different conclusions. So we could have a case, as I want, we did have one, so does this comma in section such and such of the Internal Revenue Code mean that the next word, which was for, should be read as a which or a that? Yeah. I like the case, no one else did, but, but uh, <laughs> okay, now. There will be a few which are very high visibility because of their content that is either social or political or has some resonance with the general public that isn't just a, okay. And so that's what will be written about. And so you will miss the cases. I'm not saying you're wrong to miss them, but you will miss the cases where we're likely unanimous and there are vast numbers, high percentages, and where the divisions are not they're not even 5-4, or if they are 5-4, it's different fives and different fours. And so you have to keep all that in mind. And you have to keep in mind that we approach these big deal cases, you know, as the press would call them, uh, the same way we will approach a case that is about the comma. I mean, you think you know the answer. I've opened the brief, the blue brief, which is telling me why they're wrong below. I read the question. I think I know the answer. Then I read it. Yeah, I did know the answer. Then I read the bread brief. Oh, <laughs> oh, perhaps it wasn't as clear as I thought. And then I read the yellow, the blue, yellow brief, the reply brief. And then the government might send a brief in, which is gray. The government's always gray. And then we might have light green for you, you, any group. It's for the petitioner. Or dark green for the respondent. And by the time I'm finished reading them, I then go to my law clerks and I say, these are the problems that are bothering me. Write a memo and put in anything else you want. And I'll read the memo. I'll talk to my law clerks. And then we have oral argument. So oral argument is really after we've read this thing pretty thoroughly and gotten memos and thought about it. And then the oral argument, half an hour each side, is for us to ask questions primarily. And the poor lawyers, I mean, it is tough. And we are not polite. 
It's really it's unfortunate. I think it should be longer so we could be more polite, but there's always the theory that if it's longer, we'll just be longer not polite. But none, <laughs> none, none, nonetheless, you ask some questions. A good question is really going to shed light on how you're thinking about it. Not to show you know something, or you have a funny joke or something. I plead guilty to sometimes doing it wrong. But, but, but uh, don't. And try and get this right. And then after we've heard the oral argument and been through it, we have a day or so to think about it. And then we're in the conference. And in the conference around the table, it begins with the chief. He says, this is, we each have a book referring to the other persons and on each case. And the chief says, the issue is da, da, da. And this is what I think. And then it goes to Justice Kennedy. And then it goes to uh, uh, Justice Thomas and Ginsburg and me and uh, 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 Alito and uh, Sotomayor and Kagan and Gorsuch. And nobody speaks twice till everybody's spoken once. And then there's back and forth. And then, and only then, do we have an inkling of how people are tending. And then the chief assigns the opinion if he's in the majority, so it evens out over the year. And then you start writing. And that means long memos from the clerks. It means lots of work at the word processor. It means draft and draft and draft. And then you send it around. And you see what the others think. And they'll send you memos. And you might change things. You probably will. And eventually, everybody's settled down. It's maybe unanimous, one opinion, or maybe that opinion and a dissent, or there may be two dissents. Eventually, everybody's written or joined. And that's it. It comes out. That's the system. Much more dot, 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 dot than you might think. And that's the job. And uh, it isn't sitting there thinking how, what fun it would be to decide this case. Never. <laughs> and it isn't just trying to get your views on No, it isn't. The job, that's why I started with this stuff. Law is a very big, complicated business around a long time with institutions, lots of cases, lots of different human needs, sometimes in conflict, sometimes reflected in the institutions, sometimes requiring some change, sometimes not. It's messy. And you're tinkering at the edges almost all the time. Before that's we go to audience questions, I, I would ask you one thing about, um, about Justice Kennedy, because I know I have made you wait, and you have waited very dutifully. I don't think that most of the American people, or many, let's just say, of the American people, have an appreciation for all of what you just described, for how thick the deliberative process is, particularly now that we're waiting on the president to, to nominate a successor to Justice Kennedy. I wonder what you would like the American people to keep in mind about the Supreme Court as we think about its future. Of course, there are certain issues that people want the court to rule on, questions we want the court to answer, ways we want the court to answer those questions. Your job is, and the job of all nine justices, is thoroughly deliberative in ways that I don't think many Americans really have wrapped their heads around. What do you want us as the American people to keep in mind about the court, the seat, the process as we wait for this nominee? One thing is that this document is, tells, it, 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 lays out some frontiers, some of them pretty important frontiers, free speech and so forth. But uh, within those frontiers, which are broad, people make up their own minds. And that's why you don't like what's going on. You go to the ballot box. I'm afraid that's for almost everything. I'd also like, secondarily, people to realize that it is a long deliberative process. When I first went to the court, I grew up in San Francisco. I lived most of my life in Massachusetts. I'd run into differences among people, but I never saw differences until I got to Washington. There were really differences. <laughs> OK, and first I thought, why doesn't everybody agree with me who am so wonderfully reasonable? <laughs> and then after a time, I thought, no, it's a big country. There are, in fact, 320 million people. My mother used to say, and every one of them holds some different opinion. There's no opinion so odd that there isn't somebody who doesn't hold it. And she used to say they all live in Los Angeles. That's because we live in San Francisco. All right, but nonetheless, forget that inter-rivalry. But nonetheless, we have a system here that does not work perfectly, but it is a system where long term, you are trying to get something to work, which is this messy, complicated, multi-institutional body called law. And we're not always going to agree. 
But uh, when people ask me, what am I going to do over the next few years? I say, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do my job. That's what my father would have told me. He would have said, do your job. Do your job. I tell that to the high school kids. What should we do in order? Well, I know what they mean. But I say, I'll tell you what my father said, do your job. And if you do it well, somebody might notice. And if not, you're still left with the sensation of you did your job well. And that's what people will do on the court. And I've tried in a few minutes to try to give you just an inkling of how I see that job. And we're all good friends. There is no personal hostility. Among the justices? None. No. There just isn't. And uh, you can be as opposite ends as can be on an issue. And when you're up there at lunch, fine. You are back, and there is civility. And I've never heard a voice raised in anger in that conference room. I have never heard one person made a, some kind of a crack or sliding remark about the other. It's professional. You go around the table, you discuss it on the merits, and you try to do your job. It never got heated? Never. never. Well, heated. Oh, wait. Heated, heated. Or yeah. uncivil, I should say. It never got uncivil? Oh, heated. If I feel heated, and I might in some case, the thing for me to do is to sit there like this, and in the evening, I tell Joanna, I felt heated. <laughs> you, uh... You clearly handle your heat better than a lot of people, I think. <laughs> that you can do it with that kind of a Vulcan aplomb. I think I'm upset now. Let's get to a few audience questions. Uh, please, we do have a few minutes. If you would, when we move the mics around, I think we have a mic there and Over there. there. Yeah. When I call on you, just introduce yourself, your name, where you're from. If you're with an organization, tell us which. And then your efficiently worded questions so we can hear from as many of you as possible. Let's start with you, and then we'll move that mic over to you, sir. Again, just introduce yourself, your name, where you're from, and then what's on your mind. Hi, I'm, uh, excuse me, I'm John Aaron. I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, teaching an independent school in the area. And um, Justice Breyer, my uh, question is, how do you deal with the subjectivity of God when it's a word specifically, as in a Pledge of Allegiance case, or when God kind of comes in the back door when it comes to a, a woman's right to choose? I have a slight you... feeling that they're like three instant cases that are somehow woven in this thing, <laughs> which I'm not gonna comment on. I'll simply say there's a lot of case law on this subject, and our view of the Establishment Clause and the, and, um, the uh, free exercise clause is uh, not the French view, which is a total separation, uh, but it is uh, designed to allow people of 50 or 50 or 60 different religions to live together uh, in one country. And I read two interesting books on that. One which I recommend to you, Archie Cox told me to read it. He called it, it's called The Law and Its Compass. It's in lectures that were given by Lord Radcliffe at Northwestern many years ago. And he points out how the freedom of religion, those are the two clauses there, are absolutely basic for this reason, that in the 17th century, after the wars of religion, as they drew to a close, and you can imagine how people felt, because to hold the opposite religion meant to condemn the whole family, including the children, to hell forever. You see? They felt very strongly, but they made a decision. And the decision was, you practice your religion and teach it to your children your way, and I will practice mine and teach it to my children my way. And that, he said, was basic. And the free speech and others grew out of that. So it's important. It's number one in the First Amendment. Yes. I, uh, <clears throat> is it working? Ron Rubenstein from uh, Piedmont, California, sort of your home base. I want to just a basic question. How did you feel about the Senate not entertaining the nomination of Justice Garland for a Supreme Court position? How I felt, I think I will say this, that I was not in the position of nominating anyone. I was nominated. I was not in the position of confirming anyone. I was confirmed. So to ask me about the process of nomination and confirmation is like asking for the recipe of chicken a la king from the point of view of the chicken.
Well. Right. No, I know. Well, hold on I, a second. That's, I, that, I, that was just a way. That was a way of avoiding answering the question. Well, yeah, but, you, but hold on a second, because I, I, I see where he's coming from. I mean, you, you may be the chicken, but you're also an American citizen. And there is something to be said about the, nece the necessity of the Senate to advise and consent on nominations to the Supreme Court. And that is an extant debate right now, whether we should wait until after the midterms, whether we should go ahead and confirm a new justice now. You've got to have a feeling on this as an American. You are a justice, yes, but you have to feel something about this. <laughs> I mean, don't you? Or are you really that just emotionally removed from it? Not everything that is thought has to be said. <laughs> Not everything that is said. Who said that? Somebody at Yale. It was very cl good, actually. It's so true. Not everything that's thought has to be said. Not everything that is said has to be written. And not everything that is written has to be published. Which we're sorry about if they did that well, with you. Right. Yes. Hi, um, my name's Ted Frisbee. I teach at the, down in Carbondale. Um, and uh, it's my understanding, piggybacking on what you said about dissent, um, Justice Breyer, it's my understanding that you and um, Justice Kagan wrote a separate dissent from uh, Justice Sotomayor and Bader Ginsburg in the recent uh, decision about the immigration ban. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what motivated you to do that, and if that's also if that's standard to have multiple dissents written or not. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And that's such a sense, I don't normally do this, and th that is special, I mean normally what I'm about to say. But that's such a special case, and it's such a special time, that the only thing I can do about that particular question you ask, which I've been unfair to all your questions, but for the same reason, because I think I just better be safe rather than sorry. So I can recommend you to read the two, and you will see if you read the two where they are similar and where they are different. Yes. Uh, Sam Gregorio from Shreveport, Louisiana. <laughs> Zintite, a little closer, please, with the mic. There's discussion today that Roe v. Wade may be overruled because that decision does not fit the text and language of the Constitution or the original intent of the Constitution. And assuming that to be true for this question, if Roe v. Wade is reversed, doesn't that call into question the Supreme Court decisions stating that a corporation is a person and that a corporation has religious rights because those two issues are not found in the text or language of the Constitution or in the original intent of the Constitution? Yeah, because you want, you see, this, this is the problem. I've, I've managed so far to stay away from it, and I think I still stay away from it. And if you want, and very interesting, if you're really interested in some of the things which you put in in a minor uh, part of this, but a very interesting book I read recently, if I can have a commercial, is uh, I read a book by a professor at UCLA whom I know called Adam Winkler on the history of corporations being a person. And if you get interested in that subject, which I'm not sure you are, but, but if you are, read it. It's a good book. Yes. I know it's not satisfactory if I don't answer things like that, but I, I, I just feel I can't. Hi, I'm Courtney Stewart Alban. I'm a lawyer and I live in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, my, I appreciated your point that the Supreme Court not doesn't think generally, or justices don't think generally, but don't, don't deal in generalities. Um, I'm wondering though, if you can then speak to how, if in ways in which you feel you specifically have changed in your, in your tenure uh, on the bench, or in the ways in which you're approaching the law, or in um, deliberating with your colleagues. Has that changed over the course of some, time? Some, I think some. I, I think that the probably, uh, say with Nino, the, the, uh, the greatest difference, I think, between us, which we would discuss a lot, and we did that, we had a great, great, great uh, event, I thought, down in Lubbock, Texas, in the football field, where they had about, I think, a couple of thousand undergraduates. And uh, I said the real, I mean, he, he, he agrees, he, he, every judge, Best, Nina. <laughs> the, 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 every, every judge, when he ha approaches a problem of text, will read the text. And it always makes a difference. It limits what you can't say, at the least. The history of it. They'll look at tradition. They'll look at precedent. Uh, they will look at the purpose of this. Somebody had some reason for writing this. 
And in the Constitution, there's some value that underlies this. A particular value of the First Amendment is not the same as the Fourth Amendment. And they'll look at consequences. So the, 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 the language, the history, the tradition, the precedent, the purposes or values and the consequences, all judges look at those and some emphasize more the first four. You know, the precedent and the, 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 the uh, language and the history and tradition. And some, probably I'm in that group, will emphasize more the purposes and the consequences. That's a slight oversimplification. So he says to me, uh, and in the constitutional area, uh, he will look more to the history of the Constitution. What would people have thought in 1789? And I probably look less at that and look more at what I think is the underlying value, which changes, not the value, but how it's applied changes over time. So I, if I ask him a slight wise guy question, which I did there, and say, uh, well, you know, George Washington didn't know about the internet, then he replies and says, actually, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was saying. And then he, he would say, I'd say, well, what about, you know, uh, if you do everything the way they did it in 1789, no one would want to live under that constitution. And uh, he said, yes, he says, that's probably right, but I'm not saying do everything. I'm saying lean more in that direction. And I'll tell you this, the way you do it, which you get a rough idea from my first statement here, mm -hmm. say, uh, he says, the way you do it, uh, uh, it's so complicated. He says, it's like this. The two campers, uh, you know, one's putting on his running shoes, and the other says, where are you going? He says, there's a bear coming to the camp. He says, but you can't outrun a bear. He says, yes, but I can outrun you. <laughs> uh, you see, I think his will be too rigid. He thinks that the approach that I tend to take uh, would leave it too open to the judges to substitute what they think is good in general for law. And of course, I don't think I'm doing that. Now, I would say over time, probably because I, I probably pay more attention to, I don't give up my basic points of view, but I want to be sure I have the precedents right. I want to be sure I have not gone too far with this language. If the language says that uh, something about a carrot, that is not a, an iceberg, you know? I mean, just, just things you can't do. And uh, so, to some degree. But you make, Sandra said this, when you first get there, those first two or three years, where you're rather nervous, you will decide things. And you will make footprints. And you will discover in later years that those footprints tend to guide you. Because suppose they didn't. Then you just decide anything you want. That would be terrible. Because then the public, the American people, would have lost control. Reason, reason through the complex sets of things I listed at the outset. But reason and consistency is the key, I think, to virtue in judging. And uh, it. Uh, Okay, you will. Anyway, I'd be repeating myself. Let's see if we can get to one or two more yeah. really quick questions before we have to go. Yes, briefly. Justice, um, you were asked a question about a Kennedy. I'm going to ask you about an unrelated Kennedy. Uh, so before you became a Supreme Court Justice, you worked for Senator Kennedy. What was the thing that you learned working for Senator Kennedy which has most guided you in your practice on the court? There were like six things, and I, my law clerks one year had them engraved on an enamel cup which sits up there. <laughs> the first one was, what was it? What are you talking about? <laughs> Something like that. But the one that I've learned most, that I, that, I, that I do think, and not everybody does, but the one I learned most from him was I would say, well, two things. One, he'd tell Ken Feinberg and me, you know, like his assistants over there in judiciary, he'd say, work it out. And you'd, we'd say, well, how? Oh, that's your problem. You go work it out, OK? That's what he was like. And he had a sense of humor, but he was serious. Out. What was what I learned the most? Uh, don't go for the credit. That's what he would say. And of course, being a senator, he has to get elected. He has to get some credit. But don't go for the credit. Credit is a weapon. You use it. And you use that weapon in order to get something done. And if you have a choice between being the hero of the hour with lots of credit or 
getting something done, and it's only 20% of what you want, go for the 20%. The best is the enemy of the good. Over and over, and I cannot tell you how many times I saw him put that into practice. You'd be, we'd be trying to get something, there'd be a senator maybe from the other party, and he'd, he'd be talking, what a good idea you have. Because eventually you'd say something, even with the other party, et cetera, that we agree with. What a good idea. Let's work with that. And we work with that and try and get something done. And if it gets done, who is it he pushes out in front at the press conference? You. What a help you were. You see? What a help you were. And the object is to get the thing done. The object is, is, uh, is, is not really to, to get the credit. And working with him on, uh, God, it was a pleasure. And he had a sense of humor, as I say. It was just fun. And it was also, uh, uh, I learned a great deal, a know, great deal working with him. I know we have and to adjourn in just a second, and I hear the elements are not on our side. So I want to get one last question in before we have to let you go. And it, of course, as we're thinking about the transition to the court, we'll have a new Supreme Court justice in, in due course. I wonder how you are contemplating your future on the court whether or not you have thought about <laughs> how you're contemplating your own future as an associate justice. Is there a point at which you will start to get ready to step down? Yes, there is such a point. <laughs> and how, <laughs> pray tell, are you thinking about what that point might look like? No. <laughs> oh, come on. No, no, no. No. <laughs> Ah, no. <laughs> See, here's, I, speaking as, I think it's easy for you to say no. But there are a lot of Americans right now who are deeply, deeply concerned about the direction of the country. And the Supreme Court is something we have no power over. We can't touch that. And so I think it means a lot to people who look to you as an exemplar of the law to know that you are there or to know that you are leaving, to give them confidence in what's going on with the courts. We don't have any power over the Supreme Court. So for those Americans who look at the court as this vast, immane, untouchable structure, and you within it, and wondering, well, what's that like? Who is he in there? What would you say to them about your future on the court? I'd say that I'll do my job as long as I think I can do it properly. And under the human, yeah, let's, let's, and I, I got a question in this form. You were much more polite. The person was really hedging around. And I, I said, but you say, how will I know when I go gaga? <laughs> That's what you really want to know. And I said, well, there was a case of, uh, which was it? I think it was Holmes or somebody uh, had to go off and see, was it uh, Field and say, Mr. Justice, I think the other members of the court feel you've done a wonderful job here. It may be time to think about stepping down. And then. Uh, I think Brandeis said, or somebody said he had to see Holmes ab about that, or, or, I can't remember the name, maybe it was Field they saw, and, and uh, he made the same point, or Holmes made the point to Field, said, you remember the day when you went off and saw Justice, whatever it was, and told him that uh, about time maybe he'd stepped down, he'd done a great job, and, so, and Holmes said, yeah, he said, I do remember, and a, a dirtier day's work I've never done, he said. <laughs> but, but I mean, I think, uh, uh, so what happens if we all go gaga at once? We won't. And, and so it will become apparent, I think, to me, that uh, uh, as it does to people as they get older, uh, that this seems to be about the right time. And uh, uh, there we are. And that's the most I can say. Well, we're grateful to have had you for this time. Thanks for talking to us. Ladies and gentlemen, Justice Stephen Breyer. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it.